the geographic and location data sets to be used in this trace stream network for pollution study has already been prepackaged into a geo database zip file which houses all the information we'll extract the content from the zip file and then run arcgis pro arcgis pro is a gis software gis stands for geographic information system these are advanced mapping softwares where we can perform location analytics and visualization workflows arcgis pro is built by esri which is the world's leading gis developer we'll open a new project in arcgis pro and name it as what we like i have named it as ashokan underscore stream underscore trace and the map view opens in front of us ashokan is a name of a reservoir which lies in the new york state on the eastern coast of united states this reservoir supplies water to the world famous new york city next what we will do is to add the geo database which we had extracted into the software so from the catalog pane on the right we search for the location where we had extracted the geo database and then open the .gdb file the geo database has been added now let's examine the area of interest closely we can search for any location by using the locate command yes the blue dot indicates the location of ashokan reservoir which is that large blue spot in the center of the software map view a reservoir acts as a repository of water you can very well imagine that to run an urban megapolis such as new york city one would need large quantities of water as well as a steady supply of it it is with this intention that this particular reservoir was artificially constructed in the early 1900s in our geo database there are three particular files the ashokan underscore stream file and the permitted discharge origin and the storm drain files i'll explain it one by one so first let me open the streams file in our map view you can see a number of streams these act as a source of water supply to this particular reservoir let's change the base map to terrain view so that we can understand the topology of the surface a little bit better and it will give more context to this study the reservoir is surrounded by hilly and mountainous terrain so the streams typically origin at the top of these particular landmass and then flows downwards into the reservoir and as you are observing there are a number of streams as well and they are interconnected in nature so this is a complex uh, you can say a uh, water body in terms of its supply of water and you can understand that because water is such an important topic one needs to safeguard the health of the water system which is one reason why we are doing this particular workflow to understand how this particular uh, topic can be effectively dealt with because this is a data set we can see the data points in this particular data set by opening the attribute table so the attribute table of ashokan streams contains a length parameter which tells you that what are the length of each individual streams as you can see uh, each stream on an average is 400 meters or 0.4 kilometers long there is also a flow direction and for each of the 886 streams which are connecting the uh, reservoir they basically have a flow direction of 1 what does this essentially mean it means the way in which the streams were digitized is also the way in which the streams flow in real life as well 
So for example, if I have digitized a particular stream by drawing a line from east to west, in real life also that particular stream flows from east to west. Our entire network comprising of 800 plus streams were digitized in that way. Next, we loaded the storm drain origin dataset onto the map view. We will adjust its symbology so as to make it much more visible and prominent. As you are observing, it is on the eastern side of the reservoir. What is this point all about? Let's assume that a nearby resident had observed that the color of this water in this particular stream is starkly different than what it used to be and notified the authority. So this point acts as the spot where the pollution was initially observed. Next up, we will load the final layer, which is the permitted discharger origin layer. We will adjust its symbology so as to make it slightly distinct compared to the previous data set. As the name suggests, this particular layer is a location where the pollutant was allegedly introduced into the system. So let's say the authorities conducted their investigation and found that some mischief maker had put in some pollutant in the water body at this particular location. So the objective of this study is to determine the extent of contamination as well as the extent of possible contamination before corrective measures are undertaken. Firstly, we will create a new empty dataset. We will call this dataset Ashokan Streams Dataset and in the environment section, we will just ensure that the output coordinate system matches our default map views coordinate system. This will ensure that the visuals are consistent and geometrically accurate. Once this feature dataset has been created, we can see that it is housed in the same geo database which we had loaded at the beginning of this study. Subsequently, we will add information to this empty data set. The most important information is the streams layer. So, we have used the feature class to geo database command to transfer this particular layer into this empty data set. The next step is to create the trace network. What is a trace network? A trace network will tell us how the streams are flowing. What is their starting point? What is their ending point? What is the length of those streams? And what is the direction of the streams? This information is already available to us, but then we will now see a map based depiction of this. We've run the geoprocessing tool with a simple edge input edges parameter. What, it, what does it mean? It means that uh, the tributaries of the streams are non-existent as in that the streams have a distinct starting point and a distinct ending point. On the left of your screen in the contents pane, the output has been created. The hydro trace network is what we named our trace network diagram, but then the Output is still not changed. Just what we see is a, a purplish translucent uh, hue across the map view. This is because we have not enabled a network topology in this particular trace diagram yet. So first we will add a network attribute. So if you realize that in our stream layer we had the uh, length of the stream as a parameter mentioned. So this is the network attribute which we will use because the currently the software does not understand where the particular uh, line is starting, what is, where is it ending, are both are two lines connecting with each other or is there any error, which is why the entire purplish hue is there, which signifies that the network attribute is either incorrect or missing. It is missing in our case that is. So, in our network attribute, we will set the length underscore kilometer from our original stream data set as the parameter. Once this network attribute has been set, we will enable the network topology and then the output of the trace network diagram will be distinctly visible to us. In the input trace network, we have selected our tree trace network diagram which is hydro trace network and all we need to do is to run that command straight away.
as you would see the purplish hue is eliminated and now what we have is a starting point and the ending point of each stream. The directionality information and the length information is also available but then it is not something which is visually observed. We have to open the attribute table to understand it. Let's focus our attention on the region where the pollution activity was spotted. The red colored storm drain origin point is not part of a trace network yet. For us to do any subsequent analysis, we will first need to make it a part of the trace network. An easier way to do so is to manually draw this point. The green colored circle is lies on top of our trace network diagram and will act as a substitute for the original location. Once the point has been added in the trace network, we will click upstream which will open the trace command in the geoprocessing toolbox. This command will help us to fulfill the first objective of our study which is to identify the streams which lie upstream to the point where the pollution was initially spotted. Just be aware that initially we are not setting a filter which will isolate the streams which lie between the red spot and the green spot which is which lies between the spot where the pollution was initially spotted and between the spot where the authorities suspect the pollution to have entered the system. Currently we have not set that filter. So the blue lines which you are seeing depict all the areas which lie upstream which some of them lie even upstream to the alleged area where pollution entered the system. So this is the first step of the workflow. Subsequently we will uh, modify the trace command to include the particular green spot also. But currently what we are doing is to save the, our results as a separate layer because we are not just interested to visualize the output on a map but we also want to see the data set for ourselves to understand what is the length of the streams which have been affected, uh, what is the uh, you can say number of streams which have been affected and so on and so forth. One can play around with the color combination as well. I am changing the appearance of this upstream layer into a more prominent shade of blue. Let me close the hydro trace network diagram so as to make the map view less cluttered. The blue lines which you are seeing are the streams which lie upstream to the red spot which is where the pollution was initially observed and the tiny green circles on the blue streams are the starting and ending points of the streams themselves. Next up I will show you a more technically accurate way of doing this upstream calculation. If you remember initially I had drawn a green circle manually besides that red spot. This may not be a very precise way to do so. So first up we will use the copy features command to create a replica of the storm drain origin red spot. This is a precautionary step. I am doing so just as so as to not to tamper the original data set. So once this replica has been created, I will run the snap command on it. This is an important command which will allow us to do this workflow in an automated way. So what we are essentially asking snap command to do is to find the spot on the trace network diagram which lies 50 meters away, not more than 50 meters away from the red colored storm drain point. So this is an automated way and the software will automatically find a spot which lies on the trace network diagram and not exceeding 50 meters away from the red spot. And this point which it will find, it will automatically add it as a new point rather than us manually drawing it. So when we had manually drawn that point, it could have been 100 meters apart, 200 meters apart and the results would not have been technically accurate. And this is a, you know, a matter of water health and public safety. So we need our analysis to be much, much more precise. So this is why the benefit of using the snap command. So similar way, now we are basically using the snap command to convert the permitted discharge origin point which if you remember 
is the point where the authority suspect the pollution to have originated. So we will use this particular uh, command snap tool to link uh, this uh, point green point which is currently as a separate layer to the trace network diagram in an automated way. Now that we have our more precisely located storm drain and permitted discharge point ready, we can rerun the upstream workflow using the trace command. We will do so but this time with a small tweak. When we ran the tool first time, we did not include any barrier point. But this time we will include the green colored permitted discharge point as the barrier. The permitted discharge point is where the authorities assume the pollution to have entered the water system. So essentially what we are doing is running a second scenario. The first scenario was a worst case scenario wherein all the areas which lied upstream to the observation point which is the red spot were highlighted by the software. This time around only those streams which lie between the red and green spot will be highlighted in the system. So. Uh, scenario analysis as you would understand helps uh, in planning and in this particular case the authorities can understand what is the difference between both the scenarios and the amount of effort in remediation will vary accordingly based on which scenario is accurate. When we open the attribute table we can spot that uh, there is 8.5 kilometers of streams which are impacted by the pollution if we were to assume the worst case scenario. But if we were to assume the less uh, worst scenario, it is 6.5 kilometers. Now both these figures are uh, high, but then uh, there is a significant difference between both the scenarios as well as and there is 2 kilometers less pollution and if true, then it will be much more beneficial as well. We will do the downstream trace analysis with a view to fulfill our second objective which is to identify the risk and extent of uh, streams which can be further impacted from water pollution in the future now that we have observed the pollution which is highlighted at the red spot. So the methodology largely remains the same we will just select the downstream uh, type of trace. This time around the scientists have conveyed to us that because the water polluted water has travelled to a distance of 6 to 8 kilometers already, it has become diluted as it interacts more with fresh water. So the further risk of contamination would be restricted to a maximum distance of 500 meters of stream length only. So how do we input this particular uh, information? We will add a functional barrier and ask the software to only depict those areas downstream which lies not far away than 500 meters of stream length. Once we run this command, the highlighted area is appears on our map view which is our downstream trace analysis. I hope you found this risk assessment water workflow uh, to be informative. It will demonstrate to you the power of location analytics and visualization as we have observed on our GIS Pro GIS platform. Firstly, let's examine the material for this groundwater vulnerability study. It is a packaged project file. All the content required for this study is condensed in this PPF file which is compatible with SRE's ArcGIS Pro, the world's leading location analytics and mapping software. Because it is a project file, the contents are loaded onto the map view of the software directly. The MC boundary layer stands for Moro County boundary. Moro County is our area of interest for this study. This county is located in the state of Oregon in USA.
Besides this layer, there are two other layers which are part of the project file. It is the soil layer and the land cover layer for this area of interest. Let's change the base map to satellite imagery. The imagery view allows us to get an aerial perspective of our area of interest. Its dark shade also serves as a contrast to the bright colors of the layer files. Let's examine the soil layer. One cannot discern much from this layer, visually at least, but this layer is very important for us in terms of the data it contains. So let's examine it by opening the attribute table. There are 8000 plus polygons in this layer file. As you can understand, uh, because we are doing a groundwater vulnerability study, the contaminants seep into the soil and into the groundwater. So hence, therefore, this layer is very important. Within this layer, there are two particular columns of importance. One is the drainage class and the water table depth. To get a macro level understanding of the data points, we can also examine the summary statistics. So let's do the same for the drainage class field. This field comprises of five categories ranging from excessively drained soil to poorly drained soil. In Morrow County, the maximum occurrence is of well-drained soil with nearly 8000 polygons dedicated to it. To understand the importance of this field, the drainage will indicate to us how readily will the contaminants flow into the water table. Next, let's examine the summary statistics of the water table depth. It ranges from 0 to 92 centimeters with an average of 70 centimeters. The higher the water table depth, the less probability for the contaminant to reach the groundwater. Let's examine the second important data set for our study, which is the land cover. As you can see, it is a multicolored visualization. Our area of interest contains several land cover classes, ranging from open water to developed spaces, barren land, forests, agricultural lands and wetlands. From a groundwater vulnerability perspective, you should know that agricultural lands and developed lands contribute to the maximum groundwater pollution because the contaminants are mostly generated from agricultural fields in the form of fertilizers, pesticides and so on and also from developed lands in the form of the hazardous material or the leakages from septic tanks and so on. What we are doing next is adjusting the map based projection. Selecting the right coordinate system as per the nature of the study as well as the dynamics of the area of interest would allow us to perform the geospatial analysis subsequently in an accurate manner. We will change the coordinate system to a US centric coordinate system in particular for the Oregon state. Projected coordinate system and map based projection are technical topics but very interesting nonetheless and I would recommend you to search for it online in case you are interested to know more. Notice how the visual has changed from before. Let me toggle the views. This is the before view and this is the after view. It has become noticeably thinner. What we will do next is to make this setting for all our analysis outputs. So that all our geospatial analysis which we will do subsequently will carry the similar projection. So one objective which is fulfilled is that all the layer output will be comparable. Once we've made this change in the environment field, we are now ready to prepare the final stage of the data, which is the conversion of polygon to raster. As you are aware, the soil layer and the land cover layer were both polygon layers, as in comprising of multiple shapes of various sizes. 
what this step will do is to convert both these layers in a raster format in a raster format each pixel will carry a unique value instead of the entire shape what this will do is to again make the input layers standardized and comparable which would help us in a subsequent step when we identify zones which are most prone and vulnerable to groundwater contamination using the polygon to raster geoprocessing tool firstly we have created a raster layer out of the drainage class field within the soils layer in the map view you can see the color is as per the five categories of the drainage classes ranging from poorly drained to excessively drained soil subsequently we will use the same geo processing tool to visualize the water table depth in a separate raster format initially if you remember we were just visualizing the soil layer as per the polygons now the interpretation on the map view is much much more easier the water table depth raster has been prepared and once again the color combinations are as per the depth of the groundwater table in moro county you can see that brown and light pink colors which are 74 and 89 centimeters of water depth are prevalent the maximum whereas the northern portion has a 0 cm of water depth now that we have prepared our data sets we can proceed to the analysis phase suitability modeler is a very powerful feature within arcgis pro which would allow us to perform location analytics and identify sites which are prone to groundwater contamination we'll name the model name as vulnerability analysis and the input type as criteria the scores will range from 1 to 5 and the weightage will be on a multiplier basis we will name the output raster as vulnerability analysis and proceed to save this model in this model we will now assign weightage to the criteria variables and iterate the sites in our first iteration to determine groundwater vulnerable areas we will make use of two layers out of the three available to us the first one being soil drainage conditions and the other one being the water table depth by default a weightage of 1 has been automatically assigned by the model let's close the open layers to have a clean map view our next step involves data transformation doing this step well and understanding the technicalities behind it will lead to better analysis and overall a better project outcome so let's first begin by transforming the soil drainage conditions layer the transform layer has been added underneath the suitability model grouping there is also a summary layer known as vulnerability areas which we temporarily do not need and so we will switch it off we will also temporarily switch off the auto calculate function data transformation entails studying the existing distribution of the data within the selected layer to aid us there is a chart on the left of the transformation pane knowing what the objective of transformation is is key to doing this step effectively by default the suitability model assigns random scores to the data fields in the layer our objective is to firstly modify the method of transformation using the central section of the transformation pane subsequently we will also assign meaningful suitability scores to the data fields the structure of the data post transformation can be visualized from the histogram on the right which depicts the data clusters from a low suitability score of 1 to a high suitability score of 5 because the soil drainage layer consists of five distinct types of soil each of which can be uniquely scored we will therefore select the unique categories type of data transformation by default each of the soil drainage types has been assigned a unique score from 1 to 5 randomly by the suitability model which begs the question what is our objective high groundwater vulnerable areas are the ones with high soil drainage potential and vice versa hence we will assign the scores accordingly for excessively drained type of soil we will assign the highest suitability score of 5 while on the other extreme poorly drained soil is the least vulnerable to groundwater pollution and hence we will assign a suitability score of 1 
all the fields will be assigned a unique suitability score. From the histogram on the right, you can see that the well-drained soil is the most recurring pixel and in the transform layer, it will be assigned a yellow color which indicates medium risk of groundwater pollution. To visualize the transform layer, we will now click the calculate button. The map view updates with the transformation of this particular soil drainage layer. Areas which are highly susceptible to groundwater pollution based on the soil drainage type have been color coded in shades of green, whereas areas which are least susceptible to water pollution has been color coded in shades of red. This may appear slightly counterintuitive, but know that we had given high suitability scores to highly vulnerable areas. With this step, we have completed the transformation of the soil drainage layer and can proceed to transform the water table depth layer. Firstly, we will understand how the data within this layer is structured. Water table depth contains several depth values all the way up to 92 centimeters. And to use the unique categories method of transformation would entail assigning scores to all distinct depth values, which is not very practical in nature. This problem can be solved by using the range of classes method of data transformation. As the name indicates, the depth values are classified into distinct class ranges. Again, how these classes are structured needs to be decided based on the distribution of the depth data points. You already know that this layer does not have proportionately distributed data points. Maximum values of depth range from between 60 to 90 centimeters only. Hence, to use the equal interval method is not the most practical option. The natural Jenks method, in contrast, splits the water table depth data set into much more meaningful classes, an aspect which is possible because it minimizes the variance of the class values within a group from the class mean. Once we apply it, you can notice that the class ranges are not proportional in nature. It begins from 0 to 10, increases to 10 to 33, reduces to 33 to 61 and so on. But the distribution of the data points within each classes is much more proportional in nature. Notice one anomaly, a low suitability score is assigned to low water table depth values, which is not what we want, hence we will reverse it. This is because the chances of groundwater contamination are high if the water table depth is low. Once we have done this, it is time to calculate the suitability model for this particular layer. Let me close the transformation pane to bring the map into full view. Don't be alarmed by the burst of red in the area of interest. As I had reminded you in the soil drainage layer as well, it is the green color which indicates the high suitability score, which in turn indicates the higher risk of groundwater contamination. So, the bottom left of the area of interest has the highest chances of groundwater vulnerability based on the water table depth layer. Let me just open the soil drainage layer to show you a contrast. In the soil drainage layer, the most vulnerable areas were lying to the north of the area of interest just adjacent to the river. Whereas in the water table depth layer, the most vulnerable areas are located to the south of the area of interest. So, how will this contrast reflect in the combined suitability model output? Let's open the vulnerability areas layer to see this result. As you will mentally process this map view, you will realize that the northern section of the area of interest, which was colored in dark green in the soil drainage transformation, has now lightened in shade considerably because of the impact of the low suitability score from the water table depth transformation. In the legend, you will see that the pixel values range from a minimum of 3 to a maximum of 8. Remember that both the layer values were scored between 1 and 5 in their individual transformation. And because these layers themselves carry a weightage of 1 each in the suitability model, the overall score assigned is just by mere addition. 1 into 5 plus 1 into 3 will be the result of a particular pixel if the values are 5 and 3 respectively in both the layers. Be aware that the true max and minimum for this data set can be 10 and 2 respectively, but because of the inherent dichotomy in the nature of the result of the two layer transformations, no pixel values carry these extreme scores. 
we will now proceed to change the weightage assigned to both these layers from the default of one. We do so out of practical necessity because in our groundwater vulnerability study, the soil drainage condition is a slightly more important parameter. So, a ratio of 5 is to 4 for these two parameters will do justice to the outcome of the study. Once we hit calculate, the map view updates with the revised scores. And you can see on the legend on the left that a pixel values now range from the minimum of 14 to a maximum of 37. Clicking on the run button in the suitability modeler pane allows us to save our model output. We are doing so because our first iteration is complete now. To recollect, we had used the soil drainage and the water table depth layers as inputs, proceeded to transform the data set with meaningful suitability scores, assigned proportionate weightages to the two layers overall, and the software used the weighted average multiplication to arrive at the combined suitability model output. Be aware that the scores would have potentially ranged from a minimum of 9 to a maximum of 45, but because of the contrasting individual layer scores, the overall pixel values do not carry these extremes. As is evident, one can click the map view to inspect the pixel values at our desired spots. Next up, we will include the land cover layer as well in our groundwater vulnerability analysis via the suitability modeler route in ArcGIS Pro. Let's expand the land cover layer first. As you would recollect, there are a variety of land cover classes within the layer. Among these, if you were to think of it, the developed land cover class and the cultivated crops land cover class, which is in essence the agriculture or farmland land cover class, would contribute the most to groundwater contamination. This is so because in farmlands, the use of pollutants such as fertilizers and pesticides would contaminate the groundwater table whereas in urban areas, industrial activity would often lead to the release of chemicals into the water system, thereby polluting it. We will keep this aspect in mind when we transform the land cover dataset in the next iteration of the suitability model. Let us organize the various layers in the content pane before proceeding to create a new suitability model. We will name our new suitability model as Groundwater Risk Zones. This time, instead of a maximum suitability score of 5, we will set a larger cap of 10 because we would be dealing with a larger number of criterion values and classes. Let's name the output suitability raster as the Risk Zones and proceed to save this model. As our input variables, we will add the land cover layer as well as the output of the previous iteration of the suitability model. In essence, we are using all the three information layers available with us as our input variables in this iteration of the suitability model. We, this time around, we will assign the weightages in advance. The land cover class will carry a weightage of 10 whereas the previous suitability output, which was by itself a weighted average combination of soil drainage and water table depth, will be assigned a score of 8. Hence, the land cover class is placed a larger relative importance than the previous two layers. We will first begin by transforming the vulnerability analysis suitability model output from the previous iteration. The vulnerability areas dataset does not contain any category or class based information. It just contains pixel values from our previous suitability modeler iteration. Hence, the continuous functions method of transformation would be appropriate in this scenario. There are several functions for us to try. The key to selecting the right function is to see whether the output of that function as depicted in the histogram on the right is how we would like our dataset to be transformed or not. For example, if we apply the Gaussian function, the tails of the dataset's values are assigned low scores, whereas the bell is assigned high scores. If we were to apply the exponential function, the smaller pixel values of our dataset would be assigned low scores, but as the pixel values increase, there would be a disproportionate and an even larger increase in the scores assigned to it. The key over here is to see the shape of the curve on the histogram, which will give us a lot of clues. 
let's try the ms large function in this function the very large pixel values in our data set are assigned higher suitability scores which is not right for our intended uh, you can say outcome which we are targeting as we change the function the map view also updates and that could also uh, be useful in our analysis this happens because we have selected the auto calculate function above let's try the linear function what we see over here uh, in the shape of the curve that there is a very uh, progressive and systematic increase in the pixel values now this seems to be the right approach because we want the low vulnerability areas to be given a low score and as there is an increase in the vulnerability we want a higher score assigned to it so we, we shall use this particular method of transforming the data set once we have decided which method is appropriate we can uh, you can say move on to the next uh, layer which we want to transform which in our case is the land cover layer the unique categories method of transformation would be appropriate for this scenario as there are very distinct classes of land covers in our data set the suitability modeler randomly assigns a score between 1 to 10 to each of the land cover classes our job is to assign an appropriate score based on the land cover classes individual propensity to contaminate the groundwater as i have already explained earlier in this video the developed spaces and the agricultural farmlands pollute the groundwater the most and hence we shall assign very high scores to these two types of land covers in particular i have a predetermined list of scores for each of the land covers so let me quickly insert it barren land forests scrubs hay open water bodies are all types of land cover which are not contaminating the groundwater that much so we will assign low scores to it however the developed spaces as you can already see there are four sub classes we have assigned high scores to it and also we have assigned high score to cultivated crop which essentially is the agricultural farmland let's calculate the suitability model the land cover layer has been transformed based on our updated suitability scores the dark green areas signify the presence of those land covers which pose the maximum threat to groundwater that is the farmlands and developed spaces respectively we can inspect the scores by clicking on the map view at the desired location now that we have transformed both the parameter layers that is the vulnerability analysis and the land covers we can see the combined site suitability model output now the dark green areas lie on the northernmost section of the area of interest adjacent to the river these areas pose the highest risk to groundwater contamination after factoring in all the three parameters critical in our study namely the soil drainage conditions layer water table depth layer and the land cover layer respectively the pixel values in our suitability model ranges from a minimum of 80 to a maximum of 168 we can inspect these scores at our particular spots of interest by clicking on the map view as well let's observe the output closely now we can use bookmarked views to hover around the areas which we have determined to be critical for us so for example the six green circles present in this map view we will use the swipe tool which will allow us to toggle between the imagery view and the output view what we can notice is that these appear to be high intensity developed spaces most likely to be a sewage treatment plant let's go to another bookmarked view which contains dark green spots by using the swipe tool we can see that these appear to be something very similar to a port operation so moro county our area of interest contains a river port besides the river so this is likely to be port activity let's zoom out we will save the output because our iteration 2 of this model is now complete as part of our third and final iteration our objective is to identify those areas within the high risk zones identified as part of the second iteration which can be targeted or earmarked for conservation efforts 
to assist us in this objective, we will use the CON tool, which is short for Conditional Evaluation. The input data set for this tool will be the suitability model generated in our previous iteration. What we are asking CON Geoprocessing tool to do is to extract only those pixels from the input layer which are greater than 100 in value. Essentially, these are the dark green pixels which you are seeing on your map view which carry the most threat to groundwater contamination as well. This is the first phase of our analysis. We will use the CON tool once again to identify those areas within these greater than 100 high risk zones which can be earmarked for conservation efforts. Upon running the CON tool, we can see that the desired conditional layer comprising the greater than 100 valued pixels or the dark green pixels has been extracted. This new layer is color coded from black to white, black denoting those pixel values which are nearer to the lower limit of 100, while whiter shades denote those pixel values closer to the upper limit of 167. We can randomly inspect the scores manually by clicking on the map view to see if these are greater than 100 in value. So now, which areas from within this newly generated layer would you earmark for protection and conservation efforts? If you were to think about it carefully, we cannot target those patches of land which are already being intensively used, either for industrial purposes, farming purposes, residential purposes and so on. However, we can certainly look to protect those areas which are currently undeveloped. Example, forests, barren lands, grasslands, wetlands and so on. In the second run of the CON tool, we'll ask the tool to conditionally evaluate and ex extract exactly these type of land cover classes from the land cover data set. We will select these land cover classes from the list. We will name the output layer as undeveloped areas. Can we run the CON tool now? Not really, because if we were to run it in this way, the tool will extract the land cover classes from the entire area of interest. This is not what we want. We want the land cover classes to be extracted from the pixel values which are greater than 100, which is the output of our previous CON tool. Therefore, we will insert high risk zones, which was the new black and white gen layer which was generated as our mask in the environment section. Now we are ready to run the CON tool. Hang on, there doesn't seem to be any output in the map view. Have we made a mistake? Not really. Just that the extracted zones are very small in nature. So we will zoom into the area near the river. These red spots are the spots which can be targeted for the conservation effort. These are not the only spots in the map view. There are several such clusters. In the attribute table of this newly generated layer, you can see that there are three distinct types of land cover classes which have been extracted. It is currently named as 31, 52 and 81 which is the serial number but we will soon identify which are those three land covers which have been identified. So number 31 stands for barren land, 52 stands for shrub or scrub land and 81 stands for the hay or pasture land. Let's change the legend from the symbology pane to make it much more meaningful for viewers. We will name the legend as land cover classes and give the respective names which we had identified from the attribute table. As we make the edit over here, you can see on the left on your content pane that the legend has been modified also in parallel. From the attribute table, you can see that the 
hay or pasture land has the maximum number of extracted pixels which is 615 of them followed by barren land which has 63 pixels and for lastly shrub and scrub land which has only 5 pixels from the entire area of interest hence the number of pixels are very small and which is why we need to zoom into the map view to spot where these are located but once these are located we can toggle them to on the imagery base map to see whether the pixels are correctly identified and whether those land cover are what they are presumed to be sometimes when the pixels are very tiny we can also change the color of the uh, pixel so as to make it much more contrasting on the imagery base map so once we have selected the uh, pixel type 31 which is the barren land it gets automatically highlighted in the map view so the so once we remove our selection you can see that these are the yellow pixels or the barren land pixels so while we can continue our treasure hunt to identify these tiny clusters which are to be prioritized for protection and conservation efforts as they are undeveloped i think you've understood and appreciated the method involved in doing so which is suitability modeling Besides the powerful analytics which GIS software such as this one, ArcGIS Pro, is capable to perform, you would also need authoritative and updated geo datasets to perform similar workflows in your preferred area of interest. To summarize, in this workflow, we've used three iterations of suitability modeling to identify highly groundwater vulnerable areas. First with soil drainage and water depth layers and subsequently we've also included the land cover layer. Lastly, we conditionally evaluated the risky zones to identify undeveloped areas which can be prioritized for conservation activities. Thank you for watching. The rise in water pollution and the resulting adverse impact it has on water quality is a burning issue, increasingly capturing the attention of concerned citizens corporations and governments alike. Water can be contaminated by several pollutants, as you can infer from the visual. One way to categorize water pollution is based on its source. If the source of water pollution is easily identifiable, let's say a factory disposes of its effluents into the water body using a pipe, then it is called a point source of pollution. However, if let's say the source of water pollution is diffused, for example, after rainfall, pesticides and fertilizers flow into the water body from nearby agricultural fields, then this type of pollution is called a non-point source of pollution. Water pollution can also be categorized based on the type of the pollutant. Plant matter, animal waste, human waste are called organic pollutants because these are essentially carbon-based or naturally occurring compounds. However, plastic bottles or any similar type of material is something known as inorganic or synthetic pollutants, because these are man-made or petroleum-based compounds. Treating water to eliminate or reduce the pollution effectively is therefore a challenging task, because essentially water is an abundant resource extensively utilized by one and all. Just to clarify, the theme of this video is not about producing clean drinking water as such. It is more about making the water quality suitable for marine health, for industrial consumption and for certain types of domestic consumption activities. Failure to treat organic pollution in time has terrible consequences. Consider the common and increasingly occurring menace of algal blooms. A water body becomes infested with green or green-blue algae which feast and grow due to the increasing presence of organic pollutants, nitrates and phosphate compounds in particular. These blooms then prevent sunlight from entering the water body. They deplete the oxygen levels as well, thereby posing a threat to marine, plant and animal life, as well as secrete toxins into the water which results in fish kills and water being rendered unsafe for 
industrial and domestic consumption and even harmful to human health as well besides open water bodies pollution and water quality issues are also abundantly faced at municipal sewage treatment plants and as a matter of fact at most wastewater and effluent treatment plants the growth in human population and the rise in industrial activity is directly proportional to the increase in pollution generated and the sewage treatment plants are often unable to process the household and industrial waste effectively in turn they release this untreated sewage in open water bodies which is a major point source of pollution water quality is typically assessed under these groupings physical characteristics of water are typically measured such as temperature ph dissolved and suspended solids turbidity or clarity of water and so on Oxygen is the life force of a marine environment and perhaps its best indicator of water quality. The presence of dissolved oxygen or DO indicates whether there is sufficient oxygen in the water body which would allow the marine plants and animals to survive. Biochemical oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand indicates the oxygen consumption levels of microorganisms and aerobic bacteria. these organisms use oxygen in their quest to break down the organic matter which is the food for them in the water therefore if the bod and cod levels in the water body is more it implies the presence of large quantity of organic pollution it also implies that there will be less and less dissolved oxygen in the water body for the fishes and marine plants organics such as fats oil and grease is also typically measured The presence of heavy metals is looked with serious concern because these cause the deadly diseases in humans such as cancer the presence of lead nickel zinc mercury and so on ions and minerals are your standard water parameter chlorides fluorides hardness of water and other minerals and so on microbiologics is something which is present in human and animal waste in particular so fecal coliforms and total coliforms are water quality parameters which sewage treatment plants uh, struggle to basically control and treat it effectively the norms for these water quality parameters are set up by the state pollution control boards or the central pollution control board here in india in this visual you can see seven parameters by which the performance of a sewage treatment plant is assessed these comprise of bod cod total nitrogen and phosphorus ammonic nitrogen total suspended solids and fecal coliforms as you can infer from the visual the norms have become more stringent over a period of time not only that the emphasis on routine water quality checks is also felt and imposition of strict fines on sewage treatment plants on municipal corporations is a routine occurrence in india these days the impact that water pollution has on our society in general and on the planet as a whole is immense water pollution adversely impacts the health of the marine environment as well as human health industrial and agricultural productivity suffers too and lest we forget there is a significant cost also involved in treating this water pollution you can choose to pause the video here to examine the various categories and the pointers within now that we have laid an elaborate context on what water pollution is all about it is time to move on to the next section which is water treatment organizations corporations and governments prefer that water treatment should have three important characteristics a it should be effective at treating the pollution b it should be scalable as in it should be able to treat large quantities of water and c it should be cost effective my firm interlock mapping services sells a novel nanotechnology based natural water treatment solution which helps check all these three boxes to help rejuvenate open water bodies such as ponds lakes drains and rivers as well as enhances the performance of conventional water and sewage treatment plants let me explain how while water treatment techniques are a relatively new phenomenon water pollution has always existed in some form even if in far lesser quantities and mostly being organic in nature Then you may wonder how was the pollution treated historically did the water body cleanse itself the answer is yes it is the aquatic food chain which has certain inbuilt mechanisms which allows the water body to remain smell free mosquito free 
and maintain pollutants at low levels. From the visual, you can infer that there are four rungs of the aquatic food chain. The lowest rung comprises of micro and macro organisms. The second rung comprises of certain more complex organisms such as zooplankton and queen conch. Above them are the small fishes and even above them are the large fishes. So the lowest rung, the organisms basically consume oxygen. Remember the previous slide where I had explained how oxygen is one of the most important parameters in the water body. So these microorganisms consume oxygen and they use up the nitrates, phosphates and minerals in the organic waste as it is food to them. Subsequently, creatures such as zooplankton consume these micro and macroorganisms and as we go higher up in the food chain, you have other predators as well. Now this nanotechnology based solution has been devised utilizing a deep understanding of the aquatic food web. The solution itself is comprised of nanonutrients embedded in silica particles. When these are inserted into the water body, these particles are absorbed as food only by a particular type of plankton known as diatoms or diatom algae. These microorganisms are prolifically present in the water. Diatoms algae cell walls are silica based which is why they constantly seek silica from the environment and these nanonutrients are a source of food for them. This acceleration of growth of diatom algae forms the cornerstone of our solution. Diatom algae have three important remediating characteristics. Firstly, they absorb dissolved carbon dioxide and release 100% pure oxygen nanobubbles which remain dissolved in the water body for a long duration of time. This activity happens during the day in the presence of photosynthesis. Secondly, it also consumes pollutants like nitrates and phosphates which act as food for them. Thirdly, the rate of growth of diatom algae far exceeds that of the harmful green and blue-green algae. This is the same algae which was responsible for the harmful toxic algal blooms. So what happens is because the food is consumed by diatom algae, it suppresses the growth of the harmful algae as well. The oxygen nanobubbles that are present in the water gets consumed by aerobic bacteria, which is the second character in our story. Aerobic bacteria has a remediating characteristic in that for its food, it breaks down harmful and complex organic compounds which are present in the sludge and water into harmless and simpler organic compounds. This brings us to the third and final important character of our story which is zooplankton. Zooplankton consumes diatoms as food. Now during the day diatoms as you know released oxygen and consumed carbon dioxide. During the night because of lack of photosynthesis the process reverses. This would have resulted in the reduction in the quantity of dissolved oxygen which had increased earlier during the day. But because zooplankton consumes this diatoms, the level of dissolved oxygen in the water remains constant which is a big plus for us. The second remediating characteristic of zooplankton is that it also consumes the simpler organic compounds which was generated by the aerobic bacteria. So the pollution quantity also reduces. And if these two remediating characteristics weren't sufficient, you would also be delighted to know that zooplankton consumes mosquito larvae, bacteria including the pathogenic ones and other forms of waste. The net result of this three character driven story is that the treated water becomes smell free, mosquito free, largely free of pollutants and also much clearer. Wasn't this interesting? This is how the nanotechnology based solution leverages the understanding of the aquatic food web to encourage a thriving marine ecosystem which naturally cleanses the organic water pollution just in a matter of couple of months. The method of application of this solution is simple too. All you need are three pieces of equipment, a preparatory drum where you will have to initially mix the solution with jaggery to culture the diatoms and aerobic bacteria which will accelerate the treatment process. This step is optional. Secondly, you will require a spraying hose 
which will allow you to dispense the cultured or non-cultured solution into the water body easily. Thirdly, water sensors will help you monitor the water quality metrics from time to time during the initial project. Bringing the water body to a steady state would need 45 to 60 days of continuous treatment, post which the quantity of solution to be applied will be very small, just enough for maintenance purposes that is, as new polluted water enters into the system. We will also give you a dosing plan for the initial run and even advise you at which locations to insert our proprietary liquid to have the best results. Let's examine certain visuals and videos from real life projects. This is a video from a polluted lake in an urban city of India, pre-treatment. As you can see, the water is like a drain water and there is ample amount of waste in the water body and around it as well. The stench emanating from it is also immense. The first step of the treatment would be to remove any floating objects wood which are uh, on the surface of the water such as plastic waste or plants, if any. We can now dose the water body with our treatment liquid using a spraying hose. In a matter of a few days, visible cues of the water treatment in action will be observed, as you will see from the following videos. What you are seeing over here is sludge, which is a semi-solid slurry of organic waste matter. Sludge is dislodged from the bottom of the water body where it resides and the floating sludge is quickly disintegrated by the high levels of aerobic bacteria activity. Isn't this remarkable? The ripples that you are seeing on the surface of the water body is not rain water falling on the lake. It is actually caused by the release of the oxygen nanobubbles which if you remember are released by diatoms as they consume carbon dioxide and the phosphates and nitrates from the water. This footage is from another project where already the treatment has taken place. In the initial portion of the video, you are seeing the water near the inlet source, as in where new polluted water comes into the system. So you can see that the turbidity in the water is there, which indicates the presence of pollution, as in the clarity in the water is not that great. But as the footage will pan out, you can see how the previous treatment has been working the water is much much more clearer. In this section of the pond, the water is completely clear. You can even see the vegetation and the surface of the pond. Isn't it so nice to see a water body fully rejuvenated and sparkling clean? These are the stills from the previous test site. You can compare the difference. This visual is from an international project location. The pond over here is infested with a harmful algal bloom. After the treatment, the beauty of the landscape has increased manifold. There is no trace of the infestation and the water quality has also become clearer. These are some other project visuals. A common cue is that the bottom of the pond also becomes visible after the treatment has taken its effect. This is a location where uh, the sugar mill effluents were released into a water body and the water quality was extremely poor. But on the bottom right, you can see how the clarity of the water has improved. These are the before and after water samples. Evidently, the treatment has worked. Even animals which used to shy away from the untreated water body now come over to drink water from this treated pond. As I had indicated, the treatment can be facilitated not only at open water bodies but also at sewage treatment plants. 
The following are the water quality measurements from a 3 MLD STP in a city of India. Pollutants like phosphates, oil and grease, fecal coliforms have been completely eliminated, whereas the levels of BOD, COD, ammonia, total suspended solids and total phosphorus have been significantly reduced as well. The dissolved oxygen in the water has increased considerably too. pH levels are also maintained. The result from other test locations have been encouraging as well. Besides these quality parameters, another important benefit is that mosquitoes don't grow in this water because it is consumed at the larvae stage by the zooplankton. A wastewater or a sewage treatment plant is typically a large network of interconnected equipment and processes. As you would imagine, not only is setting up such a plant a considerable investment, but also operating it entails considerable costs in terms of electricity consumption and maintenance. Consider the aeration tank for example. Its primary purpose is to oxygenate the water and it typically runs for the entire day. With our solution which generates na oxygen nanobubbles into the water, one can easily power down or shut down completely these aerators thereby saving up on electricity and maintenance costs. So not only is the existing treatment made more effective but also the overall cost comes down which is one of the important benefits of using our product in such plants. So how does our treatment method fare against the competing technologies? Remember the three characteristics of a preferred solution which I had indicated earlier? The solution should be effective, scalable and cost effective. Most other forms of treatment struggle to tick all these boxes as well as our treatment is able to do. Often as is the case, the capital costs of setting up the plant is high whereas in our treatment there is no such requirement. Besides, you do not need technical manpower to do our treatment. There is no requirement of additional land and the byproducts such as sludge and odor are completely eliminated in our process. The dissolved oxygen level in the water body also significantly increases and as you know, oxygen is the life force of a healthy marine environment. In this visual, you can see the three conventional methods of treating water pollution and the problems associated with the approach. You can choose to pause the video over here in case you want to read this slide in detail. What earlier were areas of concern now are avenues of considerable appeal. By using our treatment solution, one can bring down the cost of treating polluted water. The health of the marine ecosystem also improves considerably. Industrial and agricultural productivity improves. The human health does not suffer and there are social benefits such as tourism and rise in property values surrounding the water body which can be availed as well. Some of you may have wondered that while the treatment appears to be effective at remedying pollution in open water bodies and at treatment plants, but how is it scalable or cost effective? Well, this is the highlight of our treatment summarized in a single sentence. 1 liter of our solution is able to effectively treat between 2 to 4 million liters of water. Yes, the treatment is well and truly scalable. Even the cost of a single liter of this product is pocket friendly. Besides these, some of the other highlights of the product are that it is completely made in India by Indian scientists. It is patented in India, in the USA and in Europe as of today. It has been certified as being non-toxic to fish and it does not contain biologicals or any toxic substances. The product also has been recognized by universities and awarded at climate change competitions. Besides treating water, this product also has a couple of other beneficial applications. Utilizing the same fundamentals of nanonutrients and the generation of oxygen by the dye atoms, a variant of this product can be applied in soils to boost crop productivity. The product can also be applied on turfs at sporting venues, especially at golf courses. It helps the grass to grow greener and shinier and the golf ball or gutty can travel extra smoothly on the surface 
enhancing the sporting appeal. With this, we come to the conclusion of this presentation. The first half of this presentation was intended to be informative, whereas the second half was promotional in nature. What can certainly be said is that this product has a considerable social impact. So in case you, your dear ones, your organization or your fellow citizens are affected by water pollution, then you may feel free to reach out to me. Contact details are mentioned in the next slide.